Hello there ladies and gentlemen, CX141 here, also known as Paul, bringing you the 8th installment of my arcade tutorial series that I like to call TX's Tips. In today's episode we are going to be covering the principles behind which I go bomber hunting. I must advise from the outset that this is going to be quite the long video, and as a result I would recommend pausing the video very shortly and grabbing yourself either a hot or cold beverage and a snack simply because there's going to be a lot of information here and I do not want to wane your interest too early. Additionally, the reason for such a long recording time between this video and the previous TX's Tips episode is simply because all the gameplay has been taken straight from direct arcade battles and no clips have been set up. Also, with the arrival of patch 1.43, a lot of the footage had to be scrapped. Nonetheless, with that being said, let's press on and get down to some learning. The full process. Whenever I attack an enemy bomber that is either flying level or trying to weave out the way of incoming fire, I personally find that having a mindset of going for the kill on the bomber is not always the best approach. This is because this mentality causes you to focus all of your attention on taking out a single and in some cases highly durable target, allowing enemy fighters to eliminate you with greater ease due to your loss in awareness. Moreover, Bombers, especially at higher battle ratings, roughly 4.0 onwards, have the ability to fight back with their turrets, and in some cases the amount of fire concentrated on your aircraft can be almost the equivalent of the burst mass output of your chosen interceptor, i.e. the turrets of the B-17 or a G-810. As a result, I see intercepting a bomber as a means of prevention rather than elimination. My goal is to force the bomber off its chosen approach where possible. If I obtain the kill in doing this, then I have surpassed my original objective. To provide you with a literary example, which will come to life later in this video, a B-17G is en route to a friendly base at the start of the game, flying level at 4,500 meters. I am flying in my Focke-Wulf 190D9, and I manage to line up an attack from above at 5,000 meters. I am aware that the B-17G in general is very tough in arcade mode and so obtaining the kill with the two 20mm cannons and two 13mm machine guns, all mounting maximal high explosive ammunition, is going to be difficult. In my shallow dive pass I managed to set the B-17's left wing on fire, eliminating one of the engines, along with one of the gunners due to the fire. I have taken a couple of glancing hits, with my right wing shaded light red on the damage indicator. As I come around and point my nose up to make my second run, the B-17 begins to dive towards its target and by the time I am 1km away from the B-17, they have dropped to 3000 meters altitude and now have a number of my team's fighters climbing up to attack them. I decide to break off and rebuild my altitude, and the B-17 soon drops its payload on the base, taking it out. However, very shortly after this, I am rewarded with an assist on the B-17G, and I am now in a position to prepare myself for the next interception pass. Straight away, we can appreciate our prevention mentality coming to life. We stopped the B-17 from being able to level bomb. Additionally, we forced it to have to attack our friendly base head on at lower altitudes, drawing the attention of friendly fighters and hence causing the B-17 to fail to attack any of the other bases. At the same time, we have retained our position up high. We have taken minor damage and we are prepared to intercept the next enemy bomber. We should also consider that the pilot flying the B-17 may now think, right, when I bring out my next bomber, I'm going to have to dive instantly as this D9 player is only hunting bombers. Not only do we reduce the effectiveness of the initial bombing run, but we also have the ability to dissuade enemy pilots from making future attempts up high. Alternatively, the bomber pilot may request an escort, yet our conserved high altitude position will put us in an equal, if not an advantageous, position to deal with our two new adversaries. Colossal Caliber Cannons So before we venture too far into the technicalities, you may ask, is there an easy means to eliminate bombers without having to spend too much time preparing runs and analysing approaches? In short, the answer is yes, and this comes in the form of aircraft mounting cannon armament of calibre 30mm or more, with these cannons filled in high explosive ammunition. It is the norm that so long as one or two of these large calibre shells land on target, the enemy bomber will usually be torn into two or more pieces for little effort. In some cases, you may not even have to get close to make your mark i.e. a distance of 0.5 km or less, especially if the cannon shells are fired at a reasonably high velocity. Let us take a look at some examples.
In all three clips we can see that we executed our targets with little to no effort. Even in the case of the BF-109 G6 clip, where we eliminated the B-24, despite a rather unfortunate initial pass which led to us taking more damage than expected in the secondary attack. These three clips I would refer to as well executed passes, and I shall now break down a fourth example to take this even further. In this example, I shall be engaging a Heinkel 111 H6 with a Yak-9T. To start with, let us look at our long distance approach. We're travelling at a speed in excess of 450 km an hour and still building this speed. We can continue to build speed because we are at a slightly higher altitude than the bomber, i.e. 4200 meters altitude to their 4100 meters altitude. As a result, we immediately put the Heinkel 111H under immense pressure to react even before we enter the standard turret firing range of roughly 1.2 km. If the Heinkel 111 decides to dive, we can temporarily give chase due to our position of superior gravitational potential, i.e. altitude, and kinetic energy, i.e. speed. We check around to make sure that no escorts are close by. This means we have time to set up our pass rather than trying to react to both the bomber and an intercepting fighter. I will come on to dealing with escorts later on in this video. We are now at 2 kilometers away. If the Heinkel 111 decides to react now by trying to enter a dive, they will not have the time to build up enough speed to throw off my shot. It turns out the Heinkel 111 continues to fly level, either out of indecision or an attempt to weather the incoming storm. Note: I have found on average that by the time you are 2 kilometers away from the bomber, they will have reacted, and if you are at a high enough speed, I 400 km an hour plus, in this clip we are traveling at roughly 490 km an hour, any reaction after this window will be too late to make a huge difference to the success of your pass. A beam shot on a Heinkel 111. This is the second best attack position we can ask for against said bomber. With the best being a head on from the above due to the lack of a forward upward firing turret. As a result, only one of the 7.92mm turrets can fire back at us. In the worst case scenario, we should only suffer minor damage, if any. Now for the hard part, landing a shot on target. The Yak-9T's NS3737mm cannon has a decent muzzle velocity, so we do not have to give excessive lead. I provide an additional lead of roughly one third of a standard fighter profile in order to land my 37mm high explosive round on the section joining the Heinkel 111's right wing to its fuselage. What is also worth noting here is my speed and altitude. I've increased my speed to 525 km an hour by dropping 100 meters altitude and engaging in the 110% boost. If the altitude drop had been larger, i.e. 1000 meters or more, I would not have had needed to use the overdrive to gain this speed. This increased speed also permits us not to have to give too much extra lead in our shot. If we had been traveling at 350 km an hour, we would have had to have given at least half a plane extra lead to land our shot on the same spot, if not more. So, the one thing we can take away from this example is that we should always aim to attack with the altitude advantage, as this permits us to build our speed rapidly. Additionally, starting off the run at a high speed, i.e. 400 km an hour or more from 3 km away, helps, yet as we shall soon see, altitude takes precedent over this, especially when we switch to lower caliber armament. To complete our examination, let us view a poor example. In this clip I shall be attacking a B-25 Mitchell in my P-63A-10 King Cobra. To start off this clip, we execute a decent pass on an enemy Wellington Mark 1C, thanks to our combination of a slight altitude advantage and high speed. However, soon after completing the pass on the Wellington, I become complacent and turn to attack the enemy B-25 that was flying past at roughly 4,500 meters altitude, approximately 700 meters above my current position. 
The fact that I have to turn 180 degrees instantly means that my speed will drop drastically, and the fact that I will have to climb after my target will mean that it will take me a while to converge with the Mitchell. As we are about to see, I make things worse by trying to web climb after the B25 at a rather sharp angle of roughly 40 degrees, a feature that is no longer possible as of patch 1.43 it would seem. I soon realise that I'm going to have to level out to build up my speed in order to catch the B25. Straight away I've handed the B25 a huge window in which to make a decision. They can now dive to pick up speed or hit their target, or just continue along with their rear 12.7mm machine gun turret being able to bear down on me. Whilst our philosophy does, in general, allow bomber pilot to make a last minute decision, here we are too heavily focused on getting the kill rather than preventing the B25's approach. Again, whilst 380 km an hour is quite a high speed, this is nowhere near enough to catch the B-25 without maximal exposure to their rear gunner. And now I have to try and line up my shot with a 37mm cannon and simultaneously attempt to dodge incoming fire. On top of this, the B-25 soon breaks his or her tunnel vision on our friendly Heinkel 111H and realises that they can force me to work even harder by sacrificing some of their altitude for additional speed. So we achieved the kill in the end by implementing our higher calibre cannon at long range, but we had to spend over a minute lining up our killing blow. This is too long, and when using smaller calibre weaponry, can only end badly. We should also note that our final speed of assault was 420km an hour. This is high, but thanks to the speed of the B-25 being roughly 400km an hour, our relative convergence speed was only approximately 20km an hour. This is why I would not class speed alone as a key factor in attacking bombers. Instead, it is the convergence speed between yourself and the bomber which is crucial. The higher this is, the harder it is for the gunners to get a shot on target, and the less lead you have to provide to make your shots count as depicted in the Yak-9T example. So, just from looking at attacking bombers with higher calibre weaponry, we have already attributed two key factors to our approach. Number 1. Altitude advantage. Number 2. High convergence speed. Yet we can expand on this list by considering planes without the colossal cannons. Lower Calibers Cannons and Machine Guns When discussing lower calibers, we have to appreciate that there are planes which are not equipped with any cannons. These machine gun based platforms will be discussed later on. In the meantime, let us consider planes with either a purely 20-23mm cannon armament or with a combined armament of said cannons and machine guns. For example, the Akovalov Yak-3 with a 20mm cannon and two 12.7mm machine guns. These planes can make for decent bomber hunters so long as you keep to the two points we have considered as good practice previously, and realise that the prevention mentality now really comes to life. Once again, let us take a look at some examples.
In all three cases, we obtain the kill with relative ease. However, unlike the examples with a higher caliber weaponry, we can see that we had to modify our approach significantly. We could no longer be indiscriminate in where we directed our fire. We instead always aim to hit the cockpit of the bomber as if we can kill the pilot and co-pilot where present. We can finish our mission right there and then rather than having to line up successive passes. To complete this analysis, let us take an in-depth look at another example featuring an attack on an SB-2M in my LAG-335. Since going for the cockpit will usually require a direct head-on approach or an angled attack, upwards or downwards, the speed of convergence will be very high and so the decision window for the enemy bomber will be much shorter than in beam or rear attacks. We can see here that we are travelling at roughly 490 km an hour and that the bomber is most likely travelling slightly off anti-parallel to our attack angle at a speed of 275 km an hour. This means the convergence speed will tend towards at least 600 km an hour meaning that while our time on target is short, so is the opportunity for the bomber's gunners to get a shot on us. Our pre-flight knowledge of the SB-2M tells us that it has a twin 7.62mm machine gun turret in the nose. Yet since the AI will always direct the gun straight and level prior to us coming into firing range, we can make the gunner take slightly longer to train onto target by coming up from below. Of course, if the player of the SB-2M has taken control of the turret, this may not be the case they may have already focused the guns onto our approach. Since this is a partially off centre head on, look at how we can aim directly for the provided lead indicator rather than having to give additional lead. Moreover, we need not adjust our crosshair too much during the pass. This allows the initial portion of our burst to hit the forward section of the bomber's fuselage and hence the cockpit, whilst the latter section of our burst will be directed towards the rear section of the bomber, meaning that we get a nice, uniform damage pattern. With only a slight graze from the forward gunner, we can proceed to our next target. Ergo. What this example demonstrates to us is that despite our fighter not having the most lethal of armament, we can mitigate this problem to an extent by aiming for one of the major weak spots on any given bomber, the cockpit. On occasion, especially when facing heavier targets such as PBYs, B-17s and Year 2s, this pass may have little effect or only kill either the co-pilot or the pilot. However, damage to the cockpit region means that follow-up passes, even when not directed solely for the cockpit, can lead to an unexpected pilot kill. This is also likely to generate consternation in the player flying the bomber. If their cockpit is heavily damaged and they observe another fighter attempting a similar head-on approach, they will most likely rush to turn their bomber 180 degrees to bring the mass of turrets onto target. This revives our prevention strategy immediately as we are encouraging the bomber off target. Alternatively, the bomber pilot may decide to break off their intended run on the bases or the airfield and dive to lower altitudes to instead attack the ground units. In doing this, we prevent the bomber's ability to continually base bomb from up high and expose it to our friendly fighters milling about below, who will usually jump at the opportunity to build up RP, research points, from attacking a heavily armed and armoured foe. To bring this to life, here is an example of a high to low angled head on pass on a B17E in my Focke 190 D9. Note before we even begin our run, the altitude advantage we have over our intended foe, roughly 1,500 metres, and the speed we are currently travelling at, close to 600 km an hour. We are well prepared, and have minimised the risk of return fire from the B-17. Our attack run will be slightly off centre, meaning that only one 12.7mm turret will be able to return fire. Ok, so we did not do too much damage. At best, we damaged the left gear leg of the B-17, yet as we are about to see, that is enough to encourage the B-17 to dive to lower altitudes, hence mission accomplished. What we should also note here is how we broke away. 
Having passed the B-17, it had at least two if not three gunners who can fire back at us. Rather than travelling in a straight line and hence drop my altitude further, I immediately began to pull up my nose into a 30 degree climb. Thanks to our high speed, by the time we steadied out into our climb, we were already far enough away from the B-17, i.e. a kilometre or more, to avoid the majority of the turret fire and regain our altitude advantage. From this, we can now add a third principle to our bomber hunting list, attacking via either a direct or angled head-on pass. Hence our principle list is now Number 1. Altitude advantage Number 2. High convergence speed And Number 3. Direct or angled head-on pass The angled approach is of course to avoid the fire of the pilot control guns from bombers such as the B-25 Mitchell, the Dornier 217E and the Tu-2. However, there is a problem with this newfound philosophy. Setting up a head-on pass takes a lot of time, especially if the bomber pilot knows what to look out for. We do not always have the time, and so we may have to take a more brute force approach and either attack from the rear or on the beam, as depicted in the Focke Wolf 190A8 versus G5M1 example. The beam shot is on average the less risky due to the lower concentration of turrets, and the fact that you and your opponent are not travelling in the same direction, thereby lowering the convergence speed. I will be honest, I personally hate attacking a bomber from behind, and there are a few planes I will do this with. To give you some examples, both the Focke 90 A5 and A8 variants, the F4U-1C Corsair, the Tempest Mark V, and the Typhoon Mark one b Late. Notice a recurring pattern here? Let us take a look at the armament. Of the two Focke 190 A variants, the A5 has two 7.92mm machine guns, two 20mm MG151 cannons and two 20mm MG FS-M cannons. Meanwhile the AA ups this to two 13mm machine guns and four 20mm MG151 cannons. Meanwhile the F4U1C Corsair has four 20mm AN-M2 cannons, the Tempest Mark V has four 20mm Hispano Mark V cannons and finally the, Typho the Typhoon Mark one b Late has four 20mm Hispano Mark II cannons. You may say, well they have a load of cannons, and that is partially correct, but let us also examine where the cannons are located. In all five cases, the cannons are located in the wings. This means that when not employed at gun convergence, there will be a significant spread in your burst mass, and this is great for dealing damage to both the wings and the main fuse and large of a bomber when attacking from behind. Not only are you likely to kill gunners and damage tail controls, but you're also in with a chance of rupturing fuel tanks and crippling engines. With this being said, let us examine a failed head-on pass against the B-17E in our Focke Wolf 190A8, which turns into a successful beam-to-rear prevention pass instead. Notice that I'm giving half a fighter's profile length in additional lead as I begin my pass. This is crucial, and I cannot emphasise enough that the first two to three seconds of a rear attack will determine whether you will be successful and survive. All of our fire is being directed across the main fuselage of the B-17, and as a result, we immediately kill the top gunner along with the side gunners currently firing at us. On top of this, we instantly kill the rear gunner as well thanks to the spread of our cannon fire and this means that we can soon settle in behind the B-17 and go to work. As I carry out my pass and notice the lack of return fire, I quickly come to the realisation that the only gunner who can possibly be alive and pose a threat is the ventral gunner. Hence I position myself level with the B-17's tail to prevent the gunner from being able to fire, breaking off only at the last instant so I can fly away safely. The trails of smoke from the wings indicate engine damage, thanks to our burst mass spread, hence the B-17 could suffer engine failure following this pass. Furthermore, at such a close range, i.e. less than 250 metres, 
I am able to put my rounds right into the tail section, severely damaging the elevator and hence preventing the B-17 from being able to manoeuvre well in the vertical anymore. Whilst I will not show the B-17 drifting around in the circle, using its rudder, for the next three minutes until the crew bow out, we have prevented the B-17 from lining up any future bombing runs. We therefore conclude that if we have to resort to attacking from behind, a high burst mass, combined with deadly spread, can have the same prevention effect as a head-on. To achieve such a spread, I would recommend setting your gun convergence to 250 to 300 meters, as at longer ranges, i.e. 600 meters plus, you will see the results of having a tight convergence, as cannon rounds begin to impact on the wings rather than just the main fuselage. So we may add a fourth principle to our list. Burst. Mass. Spread. Seeing as whether we engage in a head-on or from behind, this concept will always apply to an extent. Lower calibers. Machine guns. But what if we do not have access to cannons? We've really made the point so far that cannons are the way forward, or so it would seem. Attacking a bomb with machine guns can be just as deadly, especially if we combine the archetypal high rate of fire of machine guns, by comparison with cannons, with the concept of incendiary rounds. As the name suggests, these rounds, if instant on flammable material such as fuel, will have a higher chance of igniting said material than the standard armour piercing round, i.e. by comparison of armour piercing rounds with armour piercing incendiary rounds fired from the American Browning 50 caliber machine gun. Ergo, we can implement this to deal a large amount of damage to a heavy bomber without necessarily having to be in pursuit of our target for a prolonged period of time. Why is this so? Well, fire can achieve a number of crippling blows to an enemy bomber the majority of which I have listed below. Number 1. As one of the aircraft's fuel tanks will usually be ablaze, the fuel load of the bomber will be drained at a higher rate, sometimes emptying the bomber's fuel load completely. Number 2. The fire may cause one of the aircraft's wings to break off from the airframe if the structural integrity is compromised. Number 3. The fire can kill multiple gunners, making it easier for you to line up successive approaches on target. Number 4. The fire can cause engine failure, slowing the bomber increasing its chances of crashing. Number 5. The fire can knock out key controls such as aileron and elevator control. Number 6. The fire can kill the pilot, or, if there are multiple pilots, both. Number 7. The fire can, in very rare cases, actually ignite the bomb bay and cause the bomber's payload to detonate. Please be aware that I have achieved this only on two occasions, and this is more of a speculation, as it is such a rare occurrence in my experience. There is one caveat to this, however. We need to ignite our target in a region, or multiple regions, whereby there is enough fuel to keep the fire burning for an extended period of time. If we can achieve this, then we will achieve maximal damage for minimum effort, as our fire will not exhaust itself immediately. When the fire is extinguished, the damage we have thus far inflicted will make our next pass a lot easier and so on, until our foe either dives away from us, or perishes in a great fall of fire. Returning to the point of the fire being put out, do not let this dishearten your efforts, as if anything it is a promising sign of things to come. When you make a pass on an enemy bomber using machine guns, their rapid rates of fire, in combination with their spread, if located in the wings, will usually lead to a lot of holes being punched into the bomber's airframe in a number of locations. As a result, it is not uncommon upon finishing your first pass to witness a bomber that, although it has not been set on fire, is limping away of a fuel leak as depicted by a black smog trailing from the bomber, usually from the wings. This indicates that the bomber is prepared to be barbecued on the next pass. Still, I cannot recommend a given position to aim for on every individual bomber, simply because I do not know where the best places are to ignite an enemy bomber. I can, however, recommend a position common to every bomber which I aim for to achieve an extended blaze, as depicted in this screenshot on a B-17. As highlighted on your screen, if you can place a burst of incendiary ammunition between the innermost engine on a given wing and where the wing meets the main fuselage, known as a wing route, this will quickly achieve a devastating blaze. Reason being, this is the thickest part of the wing, and was where fuel tanks were located on both bombers and fighters historically. Additionally, Due to the proximity of this section to the main fuselage, the fire will not only damage the wing, but also the main fuselage, hence leading to gunner or pilot kills. To bring our words to life, 
let us look at a pair of examples in our F8F-1 Bearcat. A notorious nuisance for heavy bombers thanks to the APIT armor piercing incendiary tracer rounds, its four M3 Browning 50 cals can fire at a high rate per minute. These examples have been taken from the same game and show how a lightly armored Junkers 88 A4 bomber can be eliminated via fire quite quickly. Meanwhile, B17 can be brought down over a longer period of time with a similar approach. The Junkers 88 has decided to lose me in the cloud layer. As a result, I'm going to continue pursuit and only find the Junkers 88 at close range, giving me little time to take them out via brute force. I will speed the video up for tutorial purposes until the Junkers 88 is rediscovered. Note: On a number of occasions you will find that when a bomber you are chasing dives into the cloud layer, they will try to level out and rebuild their altitude over time. Undetected of course. I found that the Dornier 217 players in particular regularly use this technique to shake a pursuer seeing as the Dornier 217 can build altitude quite quickly by comparison with some of the heavier bomber types. Since hiding in the clouds insinuates that you will lose sight of the bomber, as they will of you, their gunners will only automatically open fire again once you appear on the player's screen. As we are about to see, this means that you can sneak up on the bomber and get a lot closer than their gunners would normally allow especially if you are facing something as deadly as the G8M1. OK, so we are only roughly half a kilometre apart, and this means I cannot execute an extended run. Time to spray and hope that I hit a fuel tank, as I cannot see the Uncas 88's profile even at this distance. Note how the portion of my burst that hit is when I provide a third of a plane's profile in additional lead due to the fact that I am coming in from the beam as the bomber is diving. The Junkers 88 can now be left alone. I have ignited the plane in at least two locations. Turns out the fuel tank in the wing on both wings. And it is highly unlikely both fires will go out. Now I can turn my attentions onto a B-17 that is about to pass beneath me. The Junkers 88 has now burnt to a crisp, and the B-17's right wing is aflame towards the wingtip. This fire will not last for very long, and will not do much damage to the bomber as a whole. Here, the right flap is damaged and nothing else. Time to break away and line up a second run, after helping out a friendly Spitfire of course. Note here how I'm using my reload time, in combination with the B-17's loop and their lack of a frontal gunner, since the B-17E did not have the chin turret unlike the G variant, to set up a head-on pass in which I can direct my fire towards the cockpit, with my spread also impacting the inner wing sections to cause a second, more deadly blaze. In the end we kill the B-17 by removing its right wing. Remember that first fire? It helped to weaken the structure of the outer portion of the right wing, allowing us to achieve this. There are a number of planes in which we can achieve similar results, and I have listed some of my more favourable fighters on for this method below. The F-8F-1 Bearcat, the P-47D Thunderbolt, the P-51D Mustang, the MiG-315BK, the I-16 Ishak, and the Ki-61 Otsuhian. 
Please also note that the same approach can be implemented using planes that have cannons as well as machine guns, especially if the cannons pack high explosive incendiary HEI rounds, such as the German 20mm MG151 cannons, which fire large concentrations of HEI rounds in their air target belts. As a result, we conclude this section by adding our fifth principle, the power of fire, to our list of key points for hunting bombers, as sometimes a good barbecue can always come in handy. It is at this point that I could end the discussion of machine guns, yet this would be unfair, especially seen as there are some planes with limited machine gun armament which is based entirely in the nose and therefore involves a low burst mass spread. This can also be extended to cannon based fighters of the same type, with a number of examples listed below. The MiG-315, the KR-43-2, the Yak-3, and the Heinkel 112A0. Many would think that attacking bombers with these types of aircraft is tantamount to suicide, especially since the burst mass output is low by comparison with fighters of similar battle ratings. Yet these planes can really take bombers by surprise. Instead of taking the bomber down by means of superior firepower, we instead have to demonstrate the highest possible level of precision in attacking key weak spots of the bomber. Oddly enough, to achieve this precision, we are going to have to hit the bomber from its strongest side, its rear, and we are going to need to be accurate enough to take out the gunners before they can take us out, or quick and accurate enough to hit our desired weak spot before the gunners can strike back. When I say weak spot, I am referring to not only the fuel tanks and the wings, but also the engines. Kill these, and you kill the bomber outright. Twin engine bombers such as the Wellington, Heinkel 111H and B-25 are all targets highly susceptible to this approach, especially if you can kill the rear gunners early on. Even if you can only take out one engine before you need to break off, this will still help prevent the bomber from reaching its target. To illustrate this with an example, let us examine an attack on a Wellington Mark 1C in a MiG-315. For this attack, I have one objective above all else. Eliminate the rear gunner. Once this is done, we can begin to consider actually killing our target. As we can see, I am coming up from below at a low speed, and the Wellington has immediately turned their tail to us to try and dissuade us from approaching any further. To kill the rear gunner, we have to ensure the majority of our rounds hit the rear of the bomber. To achieve this, we provide little to no additional lead to the lead indicator. This would be the same if this were a beam or angled approach. Having killed the rear gunner, we can now build up our speed and get closer to the target. For this method, however, we must make sure there is no chance of an escort intercepting us, as we may have to spend some time behind the bomber. Here I am looking around for Junkers 87 I spotted above the Wellington when I was in my initial climb. Fortunately for us, the Wellington is about to level out to attack one of our bases. While we cannot prevent the bombing run, we can make sure the Wellington will not continue its antics any further. Time to close up a little bit more, and begin our assault at just under 0.4 kilometers. At this range, we do not have to compensate for bullet drop, and can put our rounds into the engines with high accuracy. So how do we hit the engines? I shall admit this took me a little while to learn, but let us break it down. Here we are approximately level with our target, yet even if we are slightly above or below, the same principles apply. We started off by very briefly aiming for the central fuselage as denoted by the lead indicator. Following this, we then translated our aim horizontally to the right and placed our aim marker above the engine. We can confirm our shots hit in the engine by the flashes coming off the bomber's wing in the engine section. Again, to put it simply, aim at the main fuselage via the provided lead indicator. When you see your shots hitting, shift your aim horizontally towards the engine you wish to hit, and look for the shots hitting the engine. Depending on your approach, you may need to aim above the engine or below it for your shots to hit. If you need to cut your throttle to avoid converging too quickly, do so. You can always build the speed up faster than the bomber can on the level. 
Once this engine is down, we shift to the other engine. Be aware the blaze from the first engine may obscure your line of sight on the second, and so you need a steady hand to shift your aim accordingly. There we go, one Wellington down without the need to just keep pouring rounds into the tail section. This opponent was rather focused on his or her bombing run, so if you get a bomber who loves to wiggle all over the place, try to knock out their elevator first, and force them to fly level. I will be covering how I maintain a steadier aiming reticule mid-battle in a future tips video. Yet for now, that clip clearly demonstrates how despite our apparent lack of armament, we can eliminate a bomber with the application of some precision shooting. You will on occasion actually get bomber pilots who become overconfident, level out, and try to use their rear gunner to put you down simply because you have a weaker armament than most of their foes. You can use this to your advantage by eliminating the rear gunner early on, and then cutting off their engines before they can react. Therefore we need to rectify our point concerning the burst mass spread, as clearly focused fire is just as lethal as indiscriminate spray. Hence we rename our fourth principle, burst mass spread, versus precision, as both are equals in given circumstances as demonstrated. If anything, our previous discussion of aiming for the cockpit is a great example of precision. As a result, these are the final five principles that I aim to implement when attacking bombers, and which I would recommend to you. With all five being implemented, even the heaviest, deadliest foe will fall in your wake as principles 1 and 2 will permit you to avoid the brunt of the turret fire, whilst principles 3 to 5 will allow you to inflict maximum damage in each pass. However, there is one requirement that must be fulfilled before even considering attacking a bomber, and that is... Eliminating Escorts Whilst dedicated bomber escorts are few and far between, there are those pilots who seek to stand in your way, and in all circumstances must be eliminated prior to engaging a bomber. Reason being, if they cannot intercept you pre or mid pass, they will catch you as you break off from your target, compromising your future attempts at bomber interception. Having dedicated a large portion of my flight time in my Focal 190D13 to this, I can confirm that a bomber escort will seek to either be roughly 1 to 2 kilometers above the bomber they are escorting, or at least dead level with the bomber. In both cases they will be travelling at high speed to ensure they can engage the interceptor before their charge is attacked. Taking out an escort is the same as engaging any other fighter, and so I will not cover any examples in depth. Yet I will always aim to eliminate an escort as soon as they arise, even if I have to break off my attack on the bomber as depicted in the following example, where I attack a Dornier 217E and his or her F4U Corsair escort in my Focal 190D9. Note how in this clip, the escort was quickly dispatched due to my obeying of principles 1 and 2 and their position of low speed and level altitude to the Dornier 217. It is also important to appreciate that the Dornier 217E decided to use the time I had off target to line up a head-on pass, which, due to their need to climb up towards me to engage, cost them their plane. I will cover head-on passes in more detail in a future tips video, but this clip shows how having the altitude advantage in a head-on can help one to emerge victorious. Hence, this requirement of eliminating all escorts when they arise, prior to engaging or re-engaging a bomber, precedes our five principles, 
and we conclude our final point of discussion for this tutorial. I'm now going to show two final examples of passes on bombers which I feel embody most, if not all the principles listed and our crucial requirement of eliminating escorts before all else. We begin with a clip in our Focke 90A8, attacking a B17G followed by a Dornier 217K. Notice how mid run on the Dornier 217 I identify the Mustang Mark 1A as a threat and change targets immediately. Unfortunately we run out of time to finish off the Dornier 217 because of this. Our last example is a much more intense pass on a B25 in a Yak-3. Note how we identify two potential escorts in both a P63 and a P39, yet I personally deem neither a threat due to their significantly lower altitudes. This assumption pays off, especially when the two escorts try to avenge the death of the B25. So, with all that being said, my philosophy attacking bombers has boiled down to a lot of experience with arcade mode. I joined War Thunder as a patch 1.25 as far as I recall, and as a result, over the course of my experience, I've developed the five principles which I've outlined to you today. These of course are not a perfect guideline, but a rough estimate of the technique I use and that I would recommend for you guys and girls to practice. Remember, what works for me may not work for you. And so, if you just decide to take some of my principles as a bit of advice in order to incorporate into your own strategy, I welcome that just as much as someone who adheres fully to them. Nonetheless, I've been TX141, and if you enjoyed this episode of TX's Tips, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the skies.